Well, I've got a level one interview for you. It's Mr. Greg KH. Like, can you pronounce your name for me? Because I've heard Crow Hartman and Cora Hartman, and it's uh, you know, it's probably a thing. <laughs> that uh, it's that's why I go by KH. It's Crow, like the bird Hartman. So Crow so, Hartman. Crow Hartman. Okay. Oh, well, I've definitely gotten that wrong already at least seven times, but. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, you're the man who needs no introduction, really. I mean, you know, all things Linux, all things, you know, the kernel. I've been using Linux since before I was a teenager, which is kind of an accomplishment. It was, uh, I think, a 1.4 or 1.2. But I, did, I didn't get serious about it until, like, kernel 2.0. And 2.0.36 I was, it was an exciting time for, for teenage me. So, uh, yeah, it's great to have you. Um, you recently did an AMA on Reddit. And so I thought we could sort of pick this up where that left off. If, if, you know, somebody isn't familiar with your work or wants to get the basic questions out of the way, there's the Reddit AMA, which is, is pretty awesome. But the reason I connected with you is to deliver into your hands Threadripper. New hardware. I'm always, I will gladly take donated hardware. I will code for hardware. So yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and AMD got on board because I, you know, it's not something I would have been able to do myself either, but I called AMD and it's like, Hey, the man is interested in Threadripper, and they were like, say no more, here you go. Well, actually, they needed a little bit of an explanation, and then they were like, all right, sounds good. good, we trust you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you you were able to remote into the system and poke around with it a little bit. You haven't actually gotten hands on the system. I'm shipping it to you, uh, I think, today or tomorrow. And uh, it's it's uh, it's an MSI Creator TRX-40, the AMD 3970X, 32 cores of Insanity, 256 gigabytes of G-Skill memory, and about a terabyte and a half of a four-way NVMe RAID. So very fast storage, very, very fast memory, uh, very fast processor. So that's hopefully that's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully we can do a, a follow-up or something like that after you've gotten a little bit more hands-on time to play with it. Yeah, I'd be glad to. And yes, they'll be used to build kernels. That's all I've been <laughs> You can word. see there's a little laptop spinning in the background building kernels right now, too. So, yes. Word about 20 seconds, give or take. The only thing I'm worried about, honestly, is the noise level. I think it's pretty good, but you could actually configure it to use less watts, and then it will run a little slower, but also be dramatically even more quieter. But I think it's pretty quiet, I think. Okay. Well, good. That's one of the keys. I've heard some of those machines are very loud. Uh, the um, kernel um, self-test maintainer... Shua has one, and she keeps it in her basement. <laughs> we can, we can, uh, we can rebuild it. We have the technology, so uh, you know, I don't. It's 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 exciting. So, what is what is a day in the life of a kernel maintainer like? Like, you know, what is? I think, I mean, there's a lot of answers in the Reddit AMA, so I don't want to I want to re rehash new ground. But how do you manage? so many different moving parts like it, there's got to be like a meta game here that people can learn from in terms of like just structuring events in their life well yeah so i got a lot i do a lot of different things right so i do stable kernel releases i do i maintain different kernel subsystems and every once in a while if i'm really lucky i can write some new code so it was friday evening afternoon here so i actually got to write a little new code um so i do different things right so mostly i got a ton of email i average about a thousand emails a day that i got to do something with um, file them off, and then when I want to go and say, okay, I'm going to work on USB patches today right now, I look at all the USB patches, go through them all, fire them off, build them, test whatever I need to, push them out, and I'm done. And then same thing with stable kernel patches, which I usually carve out an hour or two a day, handle those, push them out, and can go. So just carving up things, but it's all email. Everything I do is pretty <laughs> much just email. Um, I, I, I joke my kids, my son, when he was really little, he went to school, he had to draw a like, picture of what his father did. He's like, oh, my dad doesn't have a job. He sits at home in his pajamas and does email. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's my job. I don't know what kind of um, work ethic I'm giving my children, but as they get older, they know better. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that as they get older, older, they're going to start to realize that there's not really a lot of difference between what you're doing and literally just plugging your brain directly into the Internet. Uh, no. So actually, my daughter's given a talk at Linux conferences before, and she's worked at them, and my son's been to them as well. So they, oh, they nice. kind of know what they do. They're <laughs> well, I mean, it is true, though, because, 
you know, your the critical infrastructure depends on, you know, the, the wetware doing some processing there. But, you know, as long as you can, you know, replicate that somehow or, you know, just plug your brain directly <laughs> to into the internet. Do. I mean, our job is to say no, right? So <laughs> to say no and find the bugs. So a lot of it is just pattern matching and you see common patterns. Um, the best are patches that are sent to you and you're like, oh, there's no way this can be right. And you read through it and you're like, yes, this is obvious that this person never actually even tested it. So I get to say... Why did you send this to me? <laughs> My um, boss was no. angry and I wanted to send it. And <laughs> I yeah, no, some, things, some things are fun. But normally it's just, it's like, okay, that's great. Add it to the system and push it out and all the test bots go off and run on it and everybody's happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're just, a maintainer's job is to say no, pretty much. You're an editor. You edit things and you say, hey, why don't you try this, do this instead, or like carve this up into smaller pieces and I'll take three quarters of it and you can work on the last quarter and things like that. Um, I think, um, I think uh, you know, having that kind of exposure to just both the hardware and the software side of things and being able to see some of the insanity in code, um, is, is anything particularly memorable about a hardware bug or a code submission where you look at it and it's it, the code looks like super squirrely and you ask you about it and it's like, oh yeah, this is the worker. The hardware barely works. So we're just fixing it in software. That's, I mean, that's the job of a kernel, right? So an operating system's job is to make the hardware look uniform to all user space. I mean, Linux is great. You can use your user space program on any different type of processor and it just works, right? Um, that's the job of an operating system. And so a lot of the work we do is papering over these bugs. I mean, there's some infamous bugs in the, or infamous code in the kernel that's like, write a variable, write it again, hit it again, again, again. And this time the comment is like, this time I really think the hardware is going to take it. And you hit it the fourth time. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's things like that in there. Um, there's lots of crazy stuff where it's like obvious the hardware designers weren't thinking and they send the data in the wrong way. Or best is I just rejected a patch today because there's one new type of chip that for its serial ports, it wants to go everything twice as fast. And there's no way to detect at runtime which one is which. So you have to just, yeah. um, I'm like, you can't just guess. We have to figure out some way to dynamically figure this out. Besides, you're not going to build a custom kernel just for this one chip, right? <laughs> um, it's like that. It's just uh, dealing with hardware bugs. I mean, it's easier to paper over these issues in software than it is hardware. Because spinning <laughs> a new device or you got to support no older devices. Or the best is you get the clone devices. I mean, there's USB serial chips. Up. These things are dirt cheap, but there's clones of these sub-dollar chips that are barely working too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we have to support the clones in a certain way. And they fake out and they look for all intensive purposes like the real device, but yet they work a little differently. So we have to kind of poke and prod and guess and see what we're working with. Yeah, I think um, I'm familiar with some of those USB serial chips because on... On Windows, they got good enough to detect them as counterfeit, but for a, for a while, uh, they would work. And then the, the company that actually makes them, I think, figured out how to figure out which ones were clones of their hardware, and then the driver stops working. But of course, Linux doesn't care. Linux is just like, eh, yeah, they came cool. out. They were like, they were trying to break them and try and burn them up. And yeah, no, we just said, uh, we'll take the we'll take the patch, we'll work around it, and keep on going. <laughs> um, we'll be agnostic there. You bought the hardware, we'll, we'll get it to work. Um, but there's lots of devices out there. The fun ones are all the USB devices that have no vendor and no product ID. They're just yeah. all zero. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody forgot when to flash the email. You realize you could do that, and, and you get your devices to work properly. Um, that was a field day, so then you didn't have to go buy a vendor ID from the USB. Um, well, uh, the, the, the takeaway that I want our viewers to have is that literally all computers barely work and we're talking about fringe peripherals but you know i'm looking at what's happening with like nvme and all this bleeding edge stuff oh. and it's like no things that barely work at the bleeding edge too <laughs> yeah so i see the state i'm the stable kernel is backwarding all the patches all this all the fixes from linus's current tree into all the older kernels that everybody runs all the time and yeah we got a patch set saying here for nvme we finally got this to work and now we need to backboard it all because we need to get it all working properly um and you just look at these fixes and you're like how did any of this ever work in the first place and <laughs> yeah. i mean that was kind of the way when i mean the more it's turtles all the way down right the deals we had to mess with with intel chips yeah. are i mean it's scary that i now know how thing i thought i knew how chips worked but they don't i have no clue um <laughs> Infamous, there's an infamous, um, when we were working on the very first Intel security problems with that, there was this um, tiny email thread with me and Linus and some core x86 kernel developers and some Intel people. 
And I wrote uh, the report, Intel report this problem. I'm like, how? How is that physically possible that this is doing this? And Lena said, oh, it's because of this and this and this. And, <laughs> and then the only the x86 kernel developers doesn't work for Intel. So yes, it's also because of this and this. And then the Intel person came back and said, no, you guys are all wrong. Here's how it really works. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, we are in such trouble here. But there's a whole world underneath that abstraction layer between just the, how a processor exposes itself to the operating system. Uh, these we think of these opcodes that um, processors work on as set in stone, but there's a whole layer of microcode and little tiny virtual machines and other things running inside your processor. And there's like different variants of it, even if it looks like it's the same one. And it's a nightmare down there. And that <laughs> that edge is bleeding through in certain spots. And you can see that boundary, and that's gets, that's when things get really scary. Because you should be able to bleed through there. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of user space stuff is starting to kind of deal with that. And one, one place that I've encountered that has been on like the research, uh, the research side and, um, things like, you know, just doing linear algebra. So like the linear algebra libraries now will do benchmarks of all of the instructions available on your CPU, because even just different CPU families, but also different stepping, like the FMA instructions may be faster than the AVX instructions or vice versa, depending on what your CPU is. And so there's a lot of different ways to uh, skin the cat in terms of, you know, getting linear algebra done. And so with things like uh, OpenBlast, you actually will run the test on your machine. You add things in like the the thermal throttling and it's like this part of the silicon is getting super super hot so you know the performance is initially great but after an hour the performance really isn't as good and so you in user space you have to do all of this testing because i'm going to have this computation that's going to run for three weeks and i would like to get it done as soon as possible you literally don't know until you test your specific chip and your specific configuration yeah, and it's crazy. And then you can have different memory. I mean, the way memory is accessed is different across different processor lines or different motherboards, right? And it's the ordering of the, the DRAM chips. And I, it's crazy. Um, you see that a lot. I've talked to um, people who make the um, build the servers um, for giant cloud computing systems. And they want to know specifically this, this CPU stepping. How can I tell that it's different than this other CPU stepping? Because they really kind of do work differently. And then the chip designers go, no, 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 we didn't change anything. And then the, the hardware or the software OS people come back and say, no, look, it really did change here between here and here. And we need to know that because if we can eke out 2% more, that's real money. I mean, when you're doing a, a computation for five weeks, you want to if you can save a day or two, that's real, right? Do you have a sense that uh, hardware manufacturers are looking at how the Linux kernel team does things and just in, in a matter of like protocol and procedure and testing, but also like how they are setting up their hardware to drive the next generation of hardware? Because it seems to me that, that because you guys are so organized and, and have such a clear understanding of what's happening versus the black box of microcode and other operating systems and things like that, that the hardware companies sort of get clued into, oh yeah, maybe we should do this a little bit better and have a 2% savings. And so in a way, you're, the, st the work that you're doing kind of drives the next generation, or, or do you have a sense of that? Well, they, I mean, I've worked with the Intel people for years. Um, they started oh, 10, 12 years ago realizing that they needed to invite Linux kernel people together and talk to their core CPU architecture developers um, and designers. and talk about these things because we have problems with certain things and they think that we should be doing things that we're not doing, right? They've been doing that with other operating systems. I mean, Microsoft's been doing that for decades. Uh, so Intel has been doing that for quite a while. Um, I think the last meeting was over a year ago, thanks, because we can't travel right now. But um, they put us all in a room and really no managers and they talk about what they want to do next and we say what problems we've had and then they ignore us. <laughs> so there's some <laughs> things that they famously ignored us about timer issues. Thomas Gleixner's complained about how timers work for 15 years now and they still won't do it um some things take a long time it took them a decade to give us uh give us an iommu to yeah. virtual memory stuff um it works so some things they agree with and some things they don't and but yet it's not what next generation i mean chips timeline is like five six years it's crazy how long the timeline is talking to some of the arm developers it's like yeah okay the stuff we're doing now you'll see in a in a device in six years from now so <laughs> it's like, and then you forget. We have no idea what we did. And so Intel realized that that was a good idea. Um, ARM now realized it. So we've had the past couple of years, we've had a meeting with ARM um, about the same way. Um, in fact, it happened right before pretty much all the lockdowns happened. We all met in Cambridge 
for a couple of days and had their engineers talk about things and we told them what they were doing wrong and such. It was fun. So yes, we do get involved and they do take our, uh, they take our, they listen to us nicely, whether they actually do anything or not is something else because we're just software people. We don't know how the hardware works, right? Well, I, I think that you guys know more about how the hardware works than really it would be apparent because it barely works. And in order for the software to work reliably, you're going to have to deal with all the little edge cases in the hardware. I mean, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's more of a more of a general idea. So they're like, hey, we want to do this type of stuff. And like Linus will say, give me error correction memory always. And they're like, no, no, we really don't want to and things like that. Um, because we don't know how much things cost, right? We don't know how much things cost in silicon, the thing that costs in systems, that we just know what would work really well. And so think, we devise them. Do you think companies like um, Sci Fi with Risk Five, where they're, it seems like they're trying to shorten those cycles? Uh, you know, I, I know uh, Linus Torvalds, you're famous, like everybody wants x86 on the desktop and servers and on the desktop because, you know, it's same thing everywhere. But just the general. Uh, driving a shorter cycle of features in silicon to software availability uh, and or maybe things like FPGA like the, it seems like a lot is happening between risk 5 and and generally available FPGAs and the cost even though they're still fantastically expensive the cost is actually quite a bit less than it was you know five or six years ago um, do you see things like that shortening those development cycles to, to have a path toward better hardware um, I don't know. I like Risk Five. I hope it does well. Um, the code, the what we've seen is nice. Um, it needs to scale up in a few certain areas in order to make it a real contender. But in the low end, it's doing really well. Um, but I mean, Linus's famous point is x86 works good in the servers because we have it on the desktop. If we and his pitch is, um, if we had a really solid ARM system that we could use on our desktop, then it would be a no-brainer, right? We can never get that. We um, argued for years and years for PowerPC to finally get us one. Um, they famously did ship me one. It took 220 volts in the US, which I had to plug into my dryer thing. And it <laughs> sounded like a fire hose, or it sounded like a giant hurricane came on. So I, I shipped it back. And it came on a pallet. <laughs> um, my wife wasn't too happy about that one. Um, so yeah, if, you, you know, if you're comfortable and you're used to developing on systems on your laptop or your desktop, and then you can roll it off into the cloud and everything works well, because you want to famously, you want to test things locally. Now, as far as the design cycle times, I don't know. I I thought six years and five years was a long time, but hardware people think that's fast. I don't know. I, I don't know what's all involved there to say that it take, why things take so long or if they can shorten them. Um, a lot of times you only hear of things in the next year, right? So like I've infamously learned not to talk to my Intel friends and say, hey, which chip should I buy? They're like, oh, the next one. The next one's going to be great. <laughs> so, <laughs> because the software guys get it about a year in advance. And so then before it comes out. And so the hardware guys are like three years, four years out by designing stuff. Um, I don't know. With FPGAs, is cool, but you're not going to run an FPGA on your desktop, right? On your main system. Um, you're not going to run it in your data center either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was one of the things that Apple did with the um, the new Mac Pro that I thought was interesting is they they do actually have a an FPGA hardware accelerator um, to speed visual effects and things like that for people to use Macs for visual effects and and I thought that was really interesting. I mean, it's not super interesting because it comes in a machine that you know tops out at like fifty thousand dollars. So like your pallet machine, not a lot of people are buying those. It's not mainstream. I'm not saying it's mainstream, but. But uh, I did think that was an interesting way that they they solved that problem because there's you know as much computational horsepower as a desktop computer has between its GPU, even a relatively pedestrian GPU, and the CPU. Um, a lot of just end users can't unlock that performance because their software is just not optimized for it, and so things sure, like video I mean, production yeah. is just it's just not there. Yeah, and there's a lot of wasted cycles. I mean, there's a lot of waste. I mean, infamously, if you can get the data to the CPU, the CPU spends almost all its time just waiting for memory to come in, right? And then waiting for memory to hit the other third level cache and then the disk and every, network. Network is forever. So you never <laughs> want to have, have data cuts from network. Um, yeah, and you can do lots of things to optimize stuff and highly tuned workloads are great, but then the next generation of chip comes out and all those timings go off. And like you say, you have to run these special benchmarks to figure out how to run it best on your workload. Um, it's tricky, right? They want to, hardware people want to sell you the latest chip that goes faster in certain ways. Can you create a general purpose? I mean, GPUs are great. 
but now they're turning GPUs into, for AI, those computation is just all they want to do that math, they're turning into coprocessors. Yeah. And I mean, the Pixel phones have had those for a while. They're doing the, the PCI cards from different companies. Um, Qualcomm announced one, Habano Labs has been out with one for a while. And then you get a whole bunch of finely tuned stuff that you can just throw math at, and that's cool. Yeah, because, I mean, if, if you want augmented reality and that kind of processing in a phone that's not going to have a dead battery in an hour, then that also depends on that super rapid, like, hardware iteration. So, turns it, and it also turns into a software mess because, again, it just it barely works. <laughs> well, yeah, so, I mean, the, the Pixel phone that had the first um, coprocessor for the camera was really cool in that it was actually, the, the coprocessor was running Linux. So, <laughs> every time the phone would wake up, you'd have to, you'd shove the whole, image of Linux across the um, whatever bus it was to the to the little chip and then it would boot up and then the, and the camera would start displaying the thing and I got it really fast they did it fast but that was a coprocessor doing specifically tuned stuff running Linux which was hilarious <laughs> Linux is, is literally everywhere I mean it's it not is. there's no it's question the about that and, I mean at this point isn't it like on satellites in it's definitely on satellites in earth orbit it's in oh, yeah. it's on satellites that have escaped earth orbit are in and are in interstellar space I think or there was some probe, I think, that was... Uh, I think there is a probe. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is. I know we're everywhere else. That's scary how we took over the world. We always joked, and then we did it. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, um, yeah, just that pesky desktop if people care about that. <laughs> but, um, it's the that's Earth Linux desktop. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, no. you can't, but look, Chrome OS has taken over the desktop. I mean, yeah. Chrome OS is, and that's all running Linux really well. And those are, what, the number five, top five selling laptops for the past 10 years or something crazy? Yeah, one of my acquaintances has has a uh, has a, one of the like mid range Pixel books, and I think it's Crouton that they use with that. Yeah, and it cute. just got some features so the Crouton's not as sandboxed, and it's like this is actually a really nice computing experience. Yeah, if only there was some more memory on that disk, <laughs> so <laughs> I can't use that. Um, but yeah, that is a, a neat thing. And like when the first Pixel books came out, or the first Chromebooks came out, I gave it to my daughter, and it's like ah. Uh, if you lose this, I don't really care because it's cheaper than your phone. So, um, and actually, it survived. It's still around. So. <laughs> nice. Well, um, do you have any uh, productivity tips or any tips for like the next generation? Our, our audience tends to skew toward people that are in college. I get questions all the time that are like, I'm thinking about computer science, but my university has like 73 computer science degrees. Like, do I need to go hands on? Do I need the theoretical math degree? And I usually just tell them it's like do what you have a passion for and, and you'll make a difference. Yeah, the trick is figuring out what your passion is, right? And that's narrowing it down. So um, I say, so I used to hire people when I worked for a company that I can actually manage people. And I saw if people contributed to an open source project um, and versus somebody who hadn't in college, it was like a no brainer. I would take the person who had contributed over who hadn't right away because I know that, oh, they can work with other people. And that's a really talent. That's a skill that you need to have for employers, right? You can work with other people, you can communicate well, and you're semi sane, right? So um, work on open source projects. But like everybody asks, what do I want to do? What can I do in the kernel? It's like, well, there's so many different things. Just find something you're interested in. Like, okay, well, how do I find that? Just build it. I mean, infamously, if you just build our Linux next tree, which comes out daily, um, you'll see a compiler warning and oh, I need to go fix that. Or hey, it didn't boot. Oh, I'll go do, figure that one out. Or why? Why does this work and that doesn't work? I'm um, just run our latest stuff, and then that'll take you down this path of figuring out something that you didn't know. I mean, infamously, that's how lots and lots of kernel maintainers <laughs> own subsystems because they were like, "Hey, what, what's that weird thing over there?" And they go down and they figure it out, and nobody else is maintaining it, and they take it over, and then they're stuck with it for life. <laughs> um, but that's yeah. But but it's figuring out what you want to do with that, and then go with that. So yeah, try different things. But in the kernel, so at my level, I, I come from an embedded background out of college. I started working with printers and other stuff. Um, I There's no heavy math <laughs> at this level. <laughs> it's all working around hardware bugs, simple, simple, simple math. Um, yeah, it's there's other cool stuff you can do in user space with lots of fun math stuff if you like that. Um, I didn't really like that, but my school was more towards um, oriented from the end, from the Actually, it did came from the math department, so I did learn a lot of math, but I didn't like doing the math and, the, and programming. I, can, um, I sort of uh, I had a little bit of experience with embedded and printers, and um, it was uh, with Lexmark gear, and I got to the point where they were developing. It was like 
the user interface in the printer was developed with Flash, and it was like, uh, you know, I'm I'm good. I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna go this other way now. I don't. That's I'm good. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want to mess with that. <laughs> so, um, but then there's printers now. All Lexmarks, all HP printers, they're all running Linux. I have yes. HP printer in the corner. And that's funny. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's how I got into Linux. Actually, I was embedded. I was doing barcode scanners at the time, and I had to test my devices with all different types of operating systems to make sure they worked. And USB wasn't really working on Linux yet, so I tested it out, and it turned out I had a bug. In my device, and it made it show up as a 102 button mouse instead of 102 button keyboard <laughs> um, or key keyboard. And li- Windows worked fine, but Linux did not like that. <laughs> so, um, well, I can't. I, I don't. I don't know why. I mean, a 102 yeah. button mouse sounds actually pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it would be good. Um, so that was a firmware bug that I fixed, and then went on from there. But then I realized that I could uh, modify the operating system and get my patches in there, and I went from there. But I came to the bottom up. So mm-hmm. instead of coming from the top down, so everybody comes from different sides. Um, it depends on what you like doing that way. But you can I find mean, a job. There's so many jobs out there now. I mean, I, we always joke that you get five patches in the kernel and you get a job. It's not really a joke as long as they're not spelling fixes. <laughs> there, also, you can get a job. I also tend to recommend that students, like even the ones that are not quote unquote comfortable with hardware. It's funny you mentioned embedded systems because it's like adopt a hardware project. Like just do a little one, an easy one. You know. Uh, mess around with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Maybe you know, try to read from sensors on one of those. You know, analog yeah, sensors or SPI blinky, or digital. Lights are fun, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so much. Uh, or build a keyboard. Like build yeah. your own mechanical keyboard, and that is a great learning experience because you could, depending on how you do it, you'll learn a little bit about USB and the mechanical parts and the computer science, and you have a reprogrammable, nice keyboard. Yeah, and you have, learn how to solder, and there's nothing scarier than a software engineer with a soldering iron. <laughs> Except uh, electrical engineer with a compiler. That's about uh, it. Software <laughs> software engineers with uh, a software engineer with a soldering iron is powering the next generation of hardware, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it barely works. <laughs> yeah, it barely works. You don't want to see me solder. I can barely do it. Um, <laughs> well, I read I read yeah. that you were an enthusiast of mechanical keyboards. You've got a cherry blue Philco ten keyless, I think. I do, yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Model M fan, so I you okay. know, might, might be because Lexmark's in my backyard. But I've been using a Model M since before I was a teenager, and I just I can't I can't use anything else. Yeah, yeah. You get used to what you have, and I have a, I think I have a stack of them up there, and my <laughs> other ones I buy every time I go to Hong Kong. I sadly have a favorite keyboard shop. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing with the, in Tokyo. I have my favorite little keyboard shop too. And I have to resist not buying a new one. So I think my son has a couple. And... If you, uh, if you, if you are ever at an event with, uh, AMD's folks and Scott Watson is there, he collects keyboards and he has the most oh. incredible keyboard collection that I have ever seen. And it's just completely nuts. Uh, it just it, like anything you would imagine, and it's like I had no idea that I would actually like this, but this actually looks really interesting. He talked me into ordering a Model F, so I've got a model, an IBM Model F. It's a reproduction, but it's on the way. It's being produced. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those really big, heavy ones with the base like weighs yeah. like lead. Oh, those are good. Yeah, it's uh, it's all uh, it, and it's in key rollover. So my Model M's are not in key rollover, and that was one of my hardware projects. Was like, let me figure out how I can make this in key rollover without redoing the plastic. And you could do it with analog sensors. It just takes a little while for the uh, analog inputs to settle because the way that the the way that like the the clear plastic overlays are because it's got a bent back plate. It you it's only it's only digitally two key rollover, but you can measure the resistance in the wires and figure out what <laughs> the keys are. And have it's more than in key rollover. It's still the PS2 connection now, right? Well, no, you can you can. There's controllers, so like there's a Bluetooth mod. If you'd like to have a Bluetooth Model M, you can totally do that. <laughs> no, that sounds that's scary. Um, okay. <laughs> wow, you gotta, right. you gotta that's replace that's like the that. like the PCB goes out the window because it uses like 700 milliamps, <laughs> which is really pushing it with those PS2 to USB converters. But yeah. it's doable. PS2 to USB is so scary. I mean, when I, I worked on the USB protocol uh, when it first came out, and that's what I was doing, USB devices and keyboards and stuff, and it was like, this is insane. But PS2 connections were infamous for frying a motherboard. So, I mean, USB is the way it is because they wanted to make a sub $1, $1 mouse, right? Yeah. So that's the way the protocol was, and then the USB keyboard was that way. It's it's a very dumb, slow protocol that's taken over the world sadly backward compatibility Um, is another rabbit hole i imagine that you guys have to deal with a lot on the kernel but that is a fun rabbit hole i mean i look at some like what archivists are doing like 
some of the stuff that uh, uh, the people at the Internet Archive were doing, where it's like, I'm going to build a special drive for reading from Apple II discs, and they've gotten insanely fast at it. Like, you could read an Apple II disc in in, like, 30 seconds, and it's got, like, sector maps, and they've, they've, they've put a lifetime of engineering into dealing with old stuff, and that's kind of glamorous but in the kernel it's not as glamorous it's more like unmucking a toilet because it's like we're going to keep this old hardware that one guy on the mailing list is still using we'll keep it in that's okay that's fine i mean then people say oh we can't send our code in because nobody's going to care about it i'm like hey if there's one person we'll do it infamously we had a whole sub architecture of x86 because james bottomley had one machine <laughs> <laughs> we actually like chip together to try and find, form a fund just to get him to unplug the thing. Um, <laughs> and he finally did. The Voyager system, I think, is finally gone. Um, I mean, there's, I would love to see a few of the architectures go away. But as long as they have active users, gladly support it. Um, we do rip code out of the kernel. It's actually hard to rip things out. Um, but And we do that if there's nobody using it. And some of the things we ripped out were like, 10 years old by the first version of Linux. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the stuff we finally got rid of. Um, and finding, and I ripped some stuff out and then somebody a, a couple months later said, oh, I really have one of those. I'm like, okay, if you want to maintain it, great. <laughs> and do it, and we'll, we'll handle that. So that's that's the easy stuff. If you have something and you have somebody who wants to test it and keep it alive, that's great. I mean, Alpha, Alpha is still around. <laughs> um, I'm getting bug reports for Alpha serial drivers still. Um, <laughs> um, but it's impressive. It's very impressive, and they're still working on those systems. And again, you want to just chip in and buy them something new. Um, but in the amount of power, I can't even imagine how much power those things take. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but our job is to keep these things alive. And But backwards compatibility is our whole goal of the kernel. We made this promise, what, 12, 15 years ago, called the Cambridge promise we did in Cambridge, um, that we will not break backwards compatibility. Because we never want you to up, feel afraid to upgrade to a newer version of kernel. That's it's that simple. We want to if we regress. That's our one rule. You cannot purposefully break something. You can accidentally break something. I mean, that's when Linus gets mad if you accident if you purposely break it and you insist that you want to break something. <laughs> so we <laughs> rip things out and break things where you never notice. As long as nobody notices, it's fine. <laughs> well, that's so, definitely um, been my experience for yeah. the better part of using using Linux for. Gosh, I guess it's been, it's like over 20 years at this point. That's scary. Yeah, but the, the weird thing is, so we can still run that code from 20 years ago. So I get people that are saying, that have been around for a long time, saying, ah, oh, I can't believe we're still using Unix. You know, why is this old model that we had from the 70s and 60s still around? That's horrible. We should be doing something new. And yes, so we can run those programs from 20 years ago. But if you look at the code and things we're doing today, radically different. So we just keep adding new features and new support for different things. We could do namespaces, which uh, broke them up into tiny little pieces, which lets us do all the fun container mess. A container, is not, there's no such thing as a container from the kernel, but you just piece together all these things and shove it together in different ways. And you can create crazy things like Docker and all those fun stuff. But you don't have to use the Docker model to make containers. You can do network namespaces. You can namespace the time now. I don't know why people want to namespace <laughs> time. Um, and you can do all of our security models are crazy. There's new security models and the eBPF stuff that they're doing that we now are a microkernel and people didn't realize that. But yet, if you look from the outside, it looks like our still old stodgy Unix-like POSIX model. And that will work, but you can also do cool new things as well. And that the idea that there's these cool new things that work differently and take advantage of this new hardware that we have, like NVMe drives are so fast. Um, we have to do different things, right? And what do we do with that? Do we make that memory? Do we make it a drive? What can we do? And you can do some really cool stuff with the IOU ring stuff that Jan Expo's done now that he took the, um, the old PCI flash storage stuff and took the ideas and stuff that he experienced, he learned there, and made a whole new way to write do IO in the kernel asynchronously really, really, really fast. Yeah, that's, um, that's good because interrupts are, are not working out for NVMe, it turns out. <laughs> yeah, well, the problem is also we, I mean, traditionally, Linux has always been like um, doing a system call is fast, really, really fast. And oh, we were like, okay, we can do a system call. We were so much faster than everybody else. But then the whole, and it turns out they were so fast because the hardware designers were cheating. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was all the whole Spectre meltdown nightmare. It's like, oh, they were so fast because they weren't actually restoring state <laughs> across everywhere. They were leaking all this stuff. So then they made us put all these boundaries in the, in the chips and in the operating system to flush all these buffers. And now um, system calls are slow. Right. So now we have to think, okay, what do we, how do we design a system when we are 
original premise of a system call being fast is not true anymore. It, you know, the hardware is fast, um, but thunking between the kernel and the user space is slow now. So how do we do things differently? And IOU ring is that way. You queue up a whole bunch of IO and you give it a whole bunch of things and you just let it go. And it just automatically appears to you in user space and you don't ever have a system call transition there. <laughs> it's kind of magic and scary, but it works <laughs> really, really well. And you can get some really insane speeds out of it if you have good hardware or even some slower hardware works well too. So it's there's a... these new things happening in Linux and we evolve. I mean, we joke it's not... It's not intelligent design, or it's, it isn't not intelligent design, it's evolution. And that's the way Linux works. Um, we slowly evolve as to what actually is coming at us, how, what do we need to change? But um, to your to the original point, people don't realize it because they see the old stodgy Unix model that the BSDs and such are still using and AIX is still using, um, <laughs> and they don't realize it. But you can run those apps, and that's great because we want to have that backwards compatibility. Those old system calls are still there. Um, you can add new system calls and do some cool new things too, if you want to. One of the um, uh, one of the most um, um, amazing things that I like with uh, when I've got a, a fresh batch of computer science students and I'm teaching them about the layers of complexity and how a lot of complexity is hidden from them and they don't realize it. Uh, I usually ask them to start doing like date time calculations and then I start poking holes in all of the date time calculations that they're doing and then eventually that 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 lecture that talk ends with them uh, at a terminal doing I think it's Cal September 1752 and it's like okay you know how did it's like no you don't you don't need to deal with that yourself you need to let the system sort of deal with that as the introduction to because there's two weeks missing from September of 1752 okay. that's, is that the one oh that's not the year that disappeared in Europe I yeah, no. too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just September 1752 is like uh, 1 to 14. And they're like, that can't be right. I was like, nope, that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about leap seconds. I mean, man, what do you do with leap seconds? You have to do something. Yeah, time is hard. Time is yeah. really, really hard. There's an infamous page out there and saying um, all the things programmers need to learn about time and the things you get wrong. And I, one of my first jobs was dealing with time coming out of a little one, a little button, <laughs> real time chip i had no idea what i was getting myself into um, <laughs> i'm as messy yeah yeah it's uh it's it's deceptively messy too because there's the the elaborate underpinning of a system that's doing a whole bunch for you one don't try to bypass that you know <laughs> rely on that and that's that's kind of a parable for the kernel stuff too because it's like you guys don't break user space but some people will still go off the rails and it's like well that's not technically user space so that could break it also gets political too because you have time zones that change boundaries, and yeah. you have people. I mean, then so time is perfect. It's a messy hardware, <laughs> physics, and politics all at once. And yeah, yeah, and it's like <laughs> well, well, it's, it's like I'm just a programmer. I can only solve programmer problems. Ah, yeah. <laughs> there's a talk I saw once on um, there's a Wall Street Linux um, t uh, conference many years ago, and a guy started out saying, "My father invented time." We're like, "What?" He's like, "No, he worked on GPS chips." We're like, "Oh, okay, all right." <laughs> So GPS chips are basically keeping time with atomic clocks. And, yeah. my, my other favorite story there is how they caught a insider trading in Chicago because the, they did a trade at the moment it was, something was announced in New York City and they showed that that was super luminal. Like there had to have been super luminal communication or insider trading. And it's like, well, yeah, it's not those guys, I mean, they're, they're shaving microseconds off. They're drilling holes through mountains. They're going microwaves across tops of mountains. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's scary how much those guys, those, that's a whole other read, those, those types of people. Well, do you um, have do you have any other hobbies or any anything else that did you like to share? I mean, this has been a wonderful and delightful conversation. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you letting me build you a Threadripper machine. Oh, because hey, I think you're going to be really excited, both by the just ridiculous horsepower, but also the kitten-like purring of the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't really have any hobbies anymore. When I was living in the U.S., I built a kayak, but I don't live near. I, I live in the Netherlands now, although there is lots of water around here. You don't really use a kayak that much. Um, so I, my kayak's in storage. Um, no, I don't really have any hobbies besides this and raising teenagers. That's <laughs> well, hobby. that's probably quite a time sink. <laughs> Actually, the oldest one is older than teenagers, so she would get offended if she heard that. <laughs> with, uh, with the lockdown, everybody's back home. So. <laughs> It's uh yeah, twenty twenty is gonna be a weird year in a few years. Like looking back, it's like that it's, it's almost like the year didn't really didn't really happen exactly, but um 
I mean, some of us look, I mean, I work from home. I worked from home for 15 years. I mean, I've always argued that you can do this. It's really good to see companies realize that, yes, it can happen. And I'm very happy about that because um, it seems like most big companies only allow some people to work from home. Like yeah. if you've proven your worth and then you go off, then yeah, yeah we'll let you work from home because we don't want to lose you. Uh, the Linux Foundation infamously has never had an office. When I, I mean, for years, it was a fax machine above an auto body shop in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> that was an office. I couldn't even stand up in it. And now there really is an office there, but um, it's not. I think one person go, I don't know if anybody goes into it anymore. It's there for meeting rooms. Um, yeah, we're all virtual. So it works out really, really well. Um, I couldn't go back any other way. Um, but it's good to see that companies are realizing that other people can do it. I mean, what Facebook, uh, Twitter, other Google's now saying people work from home now. And that's good. So. Yeah, I think I think that'll be really transformational for the economy. Um, and also just the availability of, of skills at large, because, you know, you no longer have your local talent pool or even a regional talent pool not even a national talent pool. It's a global talent pool. Totally. I mean, at SUSE, we uh, worked on the kernel team. We were all around the world and we were virtual. We got together one time a year and hung out and met each other, but otherwise we were virtual. And then we also, there are ways to do things with remote people and managing that, that has to be done differently, right? You have to have different rules. And it's just a, a lot of skill that most managers don't have and they don't feel comfortable with. And it's just a different skill set that people are going to have to come and learn and understand. It's always infamously funny when people say, oh, yes, we want to hire kernel developers, but they must come and work in our office. It's like, wait, <laughs> a project that's distributed and works through email only all around the world, and we don't care where you live, and we must sit in your office. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that one for a second. Um, but yeah, it's it's good. Um, I like you ship me hardware and I can get stuff working. Um, some things when you're making a physical device, yes, maybe you need to be in there, but you can also go for meetings different places and you can have meetings online and it works out well. So I hope that it happens for more people that they can do this because I don't think I could ever go back um, yeah. to working from an office. I, think <laughs> I don't want to. There, there are some people that have the, uh, that I've encountered in my career that do have a little bit of trouble adjusting to separating like home stuff from work stuff and just managing their time really is, is what it comes down to. But. Totally. It, it's it, it's a lot. And we went in the beginning. I used to, my wife makes fun. I had a, a one year old. I was like, no, I'm carving off my time. This is it. I'm going to go down in the basement in my office and shut the door and work. And then over the like, over a couple of years, it's like I hear her upstairs talking to someone. It's like, hey, oh, you're going to coffee. Can I come? <laughs> <laughs> you realize that, okay, as long as you get your work done and you different schedules and work around that, then yeah, you work and you end up working more and <laughs> things like that. I think there was actually one real. A scientific study is something in Japan where they had to shut a whole bunch of people down for an office and work from home. It, it became more productive, but some people don't like it. Um, infamously, at the Linux Foundation, we had a hard time keeping a lot of people like accountants and HR people because the most accountants and HR people are used to working in offices. <laughs> and then they start working for us and they're like, wait, what do you mean? We're not seeing anybody around. And it's like for a while, they tried to have a psychological exam that you could pass to see whether you liked working from home or not. And that didn't really work out. And so it, it, it's a different skill set. Some people would like it, some people don't like it. I've worked with people that say, I, one guy who was like, I got dressed, took a shower, or took a shower, got dressed, walked outside the house, walked around the block, came in, and then I worked. That's what I needed to do. Somebody else is like, I stayed in my house and didn't talk to anybody for two weeks and realized I needed to take a shower and I go to a coffee shop. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, somebody I worked with um, was like, oh, you didn't realize that I had moved to a different state and was hanging out, <laughs> sitting in the back of college classes while my girlfriend was taking those things. So I was like, no, we didn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The, it, the it adventures of kernel developers. <laughs> yeah, that's what kernel developers. It's, um, and then, well, pre lockdown you could travel anywhere and i mean there's a conference every other week somewhere and i mean i traveled all, used to travel an awful awful lot and it didn't matter you didn't you can work from anywhere and that works out well too so because sometimes you do need to meet people sometimes there's cultural issues and there's um just personalities and once i see you and talk to you you're not gonna uh, you put another name to the other side of that email you're not gonna treat that person as hopefully as as like uh, not so they're not being so rude you actually know that oh that person has good intentions things like mm -hmm. that um some cultures um japan was infamous for i couldn't talk to um i couldn't actually talk to an engineer without a manager in the way first but once i was introduced then i could talk to them so yeah. they had to learn and evolve over time that's changed now but in the beginning we spent a lot of time doing cultural things with oh, Asian yes. the social protocol <sighs> yes 
Those are probably <laughs> great. Um, there, my, uh, I can tell fun stories all day. There's a fun story about one Taiwanese company. <laughs> well, you, can, you can share. We've got time. Okay, all right. So I went to one Taiwanese company, and um, they were not sending their code upstream. They had a driver for their chips, and they weren't sending them. And I was like, why are you doing this? And so I went in and talked to them and talked to them. I spent like half a day talking to them, and here's how the community works, yada, yada. Everybody was fine. They didn't really say anything. And then break time happened, and a few people left the room, and then everybody started asking me questions. I was like, what? What just happened? And like the managers left. <laughs> And then it turns out that um, somebody had said so the CTO of the company had written some of the first original code for the drivers. And then the managers were really worried that his code that this person wrote would be removed by the community because it was wrong or whatever. But they wanted to preserve face for that. So, <laughs> so in the afternoon, I uh, met with the CTO because he's the person who brought me in trying to figure out how to solve all these problems because he's working with Linux stuff. They wanted to get our stuff merged. And he, I told him that. He's like, oh. No, it's not at all. It was a pure cultural internal to their company. And they thought that would be say, that would disgrace the CTO if their, his code was removed. He's like, no, my code was horrible. I know it should be removed. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> hallmark, yeah, that's definitely the hallmark of a programmer. You start looking at a project and it's like, oh, man, this, this, what clown wrote this? This is just, oh, oh wait, this is me. I did this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I trip over that all the time in the kernel. It's like, what is, oh, that was me 10 years ago. Yes. Well, no, so, yeah, but, but that's the whole social issue of saving face and you have to, as an outsider, come in and say, let's figure those types of things out. And that's a cultural thing. Um, that's why we travel a lot. Which is, that's well, I guess for my last question, I would ask, so you don't have any hobbies, but have you read any good books or seen any good movies or TV shows or, or anything that you got a good laugh out of or anything that you um, particularly enjoyed? I read a lot, but I read a bad science fiction to try and fall asleep <laughs> so, i won't recommend anything there um latest, oh the new amazon unplugged 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 one of the virtual reality show but okay died, yeah, i've heard know. of it i have i have not seen it i'll have to check that out that was actually really good it was really good i mean you always cringe when you see technology and and futuristic things but it was done really well oh, good plots good thing it was a good all-around Family thing. I don't like watching scary stuff. My family does. So in the evening, <laughs> we try and find something that matches all our constitutions. So I have the weakest in the family. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that one kind of met up with that. So that's a good nice. one. So I recommend that uh, from Amazon. I'm trying to think what else I've watched. Oh, there's like bad. No, there's bad. Bad TV. Bad TV. <laughs> <laughs> you like mindless bad TV to, at times. At times like this, sometimes you just want to watch stuff like that <laughs> yeah the the stand is doing really well by stephen king and uh oh yeah but Cont i can't that, but and... my, my daughter and wife were watching that i think <laughs> <laughs> um well, yeah. yeah i mean it, it is the it is sort of the you know the, i've got a little bit of the cabin fever and usually i'm basically a shut-in anyway so like like you i'm i'm not really exactly working from home but i'm you know i'm <laughs> it's uh yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a story for another day. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every country, yeah, keeping things different. They're opening this country back up again in a couple oh, of weeks. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So we're starting. We're starting to hear, but uh, our numbers aren't super awesome. Uh, our numbers are good, but nothing's really changed. So why would they get? What's going to keep them from going bad? I don't know. I worry. Online school because we have a teenager who's in high school has worked out really, really well. He works, it, it works, all his stuff is doing great. He doesn't have tests, but he has lots of homework and assignments. And he's actually doing his like guitar lessons online, but this is great. This is all works better than me having to, we have to ride our bike around town. Um, so I think that's, I'd like to just see that keep happening for a while, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Some kids can't handle it. So. Well, thank you again for the interview. I really hope you enjoy the system. Hopefully we can do a follow up on that in, in a yes, in couple of weeks. The video card is, um, uh, Radeon RX 50 600 XT, so AMD GPU, but uh, okay. it's got some hardware bugs, so good, have, have fun. <laughs> That's good. I mean, I saw your video, and you're like, aha, now they're going to have a tester. Yeah. yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> way, we all know what hardware Linus has, and we never we try never to break that laptop. <laughs> I've had to buy that laptop before and make sure I never break it, so yes, yeah, so this will be good. Um, yeah, yeah, that will be, yeah. That, 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 yeah, yeah, that'll be, that'll be nice. There's no... 
there's a so on like for for virtualization the thing that i've been doing for 10 years basically because i have to support a whole bunch of different things is i just sort of stuff windows into its own virtual machine but i don't get gpu acceleration and I, it's funny that the coming from the other side the windows subsystem for linux microsoft is adding a lot of crap for DirectX in the kernel um, they just yeah all those patches this week yeah. that was great yeah uh and, but i've it's been doing really well it's odd it's an odd <laughs> So there's, there's two different things. One is they want to do the GPU, right, um, yep. for compute. And that's their main driver. And then they're talking about doing a um, Wayland compositor. Yeah. But that's it's it's fun. Wait till people realize that their workloads on Linux on top of Windows run faster than on Windows itself. Yes. <laughs> yes. OS X is famous for that. You run Linux on a, in a virtual machine, and your same program runs so much faster than on OS X. There was a, there was a, like, this is not, not really a story to be repeated, but like when second gen Threadripper came out, the CPU topology is so odd because two of the NUMA nodes don't have direct access to memory and two of them do. That exposes oh. a bug in a Windows kernel. Linux was fine. And so I could actually yeah, run we've had a lot of weird, we've had a lot of weird NUMA topologies over the years. <laughs> uh, the, uh, well, the, on Windows, Microsoft was like, no, everything's fine in the Windows kernel. But Indigo, which is a, a renderer, so it scales like there's no cache contention, there's no noisy neighbor, there's no memory access pattern anomaly because it basically just runs from cache. It's super predictable. Um, and on Windows, Indigo would run worse on a 32-core machine than a 16-core machine. And so I used Linux to demonstrate that the Windows scheduler was awful by running the same version of Indigo on, between WSL and on... Oh on uh, Linux no to be like, the scheduler is doing something wrong. And then Microsoft was like, oh yeah, it turns out that the, the logic in the kernel is literally, if the memory is not local to this running process, move it to the next node. And so it'll just endlessly move half the processes. The way from those. The, yeah. yeah. Oops. Scheduling is hard. So that's a black art. But yeah. <laughs> we, we hit those hardware issues way before they did. Uh, yes. Like yes. Hard. That is clear. You don't have that problem on third gen Threadripper, like across the board, and it's just it's it's. Uh, I'm really excited to sort of live vicariously with your experiences with that. But if you have any trouble or anything, don't hesitate to reach out. And okay. uh, if you if the if the GPU does do anything that's super annoying, I can send you an RX 590 instead. It's an older card, and it's basically end of life. It's the code name Polaris, but um, the uh, RX 590 is super well supported and and does everything absolutely correctly. The main problem for me for virtualization with the 5600 is that the card physically doesn't correctly support function level reset for PCI. Um, oh. And so you have to actually use the card's Perfectly. yeah <laughs> system management utilities to kill oh, power no. to the GPU and then and then bring it back and then like sort of reset the bus at just the right time. And then it's okay. But again, hardware, all hardware oh. is just terrible and barely works. Yes. Oh, that's bad. They could fix that in the BIOS. You would think, but they've been trying, and I okay. don't seem to be making much progress. Maybe they don't have access to that line. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, like I say, if you have any trouble, just let me know. And uh, oh, well. I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to pack it up. Do you have thermal paste? Like, like oh, yeah. oh, um, I don't. I can buy some. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I can. I, I probably can find a tube for you. Uh, okay. I don't. I don't know if I'm gonna. I might use some foam to just hold the the. Uh, the uh, CPU heatsink in place, and then because I don't know how, I'm gonna just do a little bit of testing and see how it goes because it's a fairly compact system and one side of it is glass, so Ooh. yeah, it's probably fine. But if you have, like I say, if you have any problems or if there's any, or if there's any, uh, you know, uh, any any sort of anomalies, just let me know. And okay. um, in the BIOS, if the BIOS is ever reset or cleared or whatever. There's a GUI in the BIOS for setting like your fan profiles, and so you can pick at like what speeds the fan runs and stuff like that. And you can also, it's not really underclocking, like it's not, you can just say, I want the CPU to only use this many watts, and it's it's a total bathtub curve. So at like 90% performance, you've had like a 30% reduction in wattage. So uh, oh, yeah, it, it's so scary, weird. Physics is weird, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> I feel like I feel like the way that it, the fan curve and stuff is tuned, especially if it's going to be on the floor, you'll probably be happy. But if not, don't be afraid to complain. I can show you some stuff, and you can fine tune it to be however you want. This has been an an, an honor and a pleasure and a privilege for me uh, to be able to interview you because you know, like I say, I've gotten kind of a lot of mileage out of Linux. 
kind of sort of built my career around it indirectly doing consulting and integration and making silly YouTube videos. So, uh, you know, it's fun. It's exciting. Um, and uh, it's, it was really great to have you. Great. Well, thanks. This was a fun interview. Thanks a lot. I'm Wendell. This is Level 1. Thanks again to Mr. Greg Crow Hartman. This has been awesome.